Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Suzy Savidou from uh, the Psychology Department in the Europe campus of York University. And uh, today we have Dr. Lina Giga uh, from the University of York. Dr. Giga is a professor of uh, mental health at York University. Uh, she holds a hon an honorary clinical appointment as nurse consultant in psychological therapies. Uh, she is also a senior member of the Mental Health and Addiction Research Group, uh, holding a PhD in Health Services, a Bachelor's in Adult Behavioral Psychotherapy, a BN in Nursing Studies, Postgraduate Certificate in Behavioral Psychotherapeutic Studies, and uh, because it's so difficult to mention everything that Dr. Uh, Giga has done, I think it would be better if uh, she told us about herself so that I don't uh, miss anything major uh, from her background. And she's going to talk today about behavioral activation uh, in depression. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, for being willing to uh, talk about this topic. And I'm sure that uh, people will find it very interesting. So, Thank you. Dr. Giga. Thank you, Susie. That was lovely. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think uh, um, it's, it's really wonderful to be here and be able to share with you some of the work we've done around mental health, especially around depression and behavioral activation. Um, as, as Susie said, I'm a professor of mental health at the University of York, and I also do some clinical work with the local national health service. It's an NHS trust here in York. Um, but generally, my travels took me all around England. However, I am born and bred in Thessaloniki, so it's gone full circle, really. But I've lived in England for 30 years now, uh, but it's very lovely to be back. So my background is first I did a degree in nursing and then a degree in psychological therapies and my PhD at King's College at the Institute of Psychiatry. And there are two really areas of work. One is digital mental health, how we can use technologies to um, implement interventions and then evaluating these technologies in terms of clinical and cost effectiveness. Uh, and the second strand of my work is with children and young people who experience mental health problems. So as you will see in my presentation, some of the slides are quite colourful because they are materials, example materials from behavioural activation that I use with um, children and young people. Um, so that's me really, and I just I'll just try to share my PowerPoint. I have a few videos dotted here and there, so it's a bit clumsy on the on the sort of digital interface. So if um, if at any point when I start sharing the video, Susie, mm -hmm. you cannot hear sound or see, then just let me know mm -hmm. and I'll reload. Of course. Let me share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, so you can see you can see everything, Susie. I could see you in a little picture. So if you nod, then I know that all is well. I see a little picture where some faces are actually moving back and forth. That's all I oh. see. Oh. Okay, let's try again. It didn't share. Um, okay. What about now? It's not done it. It was perfect in rehearsal, isn't it? Let me have a look. I don't know why it's not sharing the PowerPoint. Bear with me. So, share. Try again. And how about now, Susie? Can you see? No. You cannot see the PowerPoint? Now I see it, but I don't see the full view of it. So, you oh. know, great. Yeah, perfect. Now I can Is see it. Okay? Yeah. You can see everything. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Well, so as I said, behavioral activation for depression. And of course, hello from York to Thessaloniki, just to give you a sense of where I am compared to where you are, of course, on the left, La Dadica in Thessaloniki, and on the right, the famous shambles in York. Um, so quite different, as you see, in terms of mood and color, but still, both two places I love. And from Frappe in Paralia to Cream Tia Betis in York. 
So, um, so this is really having, uh, you know, talking about behavioral activation and favorite places and favorite things to do. These are two, two of mine. Um, so all the things I will be talking about today um, are actually a part of a massive open online course that I wrote along with some colleagues from the University of York and from South Africa. Asia, actually, where we do some work with VA. So if you wanted to see more details and, and, and expand of some of the things that I will flag today, this course is on a, an international platform uh, and, you, and you can um, log in and see it. So I will just try to play the introductory video from this course, which sets the scene and, and sort of highlights some of the things I will be talking about today. So every time I need to switch to a little video, I need to unshare the PowerPoint and then share the video. So let me do that. Health Organization, depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide and a major contributor to the overall burden of illness around the globe. Persistently low mood or irritability and loss of interest or pleasure in day-to-day -day life are two key symptoms of depression. As a result, a person who is depressed may struggle to carry on with day-to-day -day activities that give their life meaning, purpose and a sense of accomplishment and pleasure. Behavioral activation is a psychological treatment for depression based on one key principle, that scheduling and completing meaningful, purposeful and rewarding activities can lift our mood, energize us and stimulate our interest and pleasure in day-to-day -day life, thereby combating depression. In this course, we will start off by looking at the nature of depression, how the condition differs from normal fluctuations in mood and what causes maintains or exacerbates depression. We will ask you to think about your own encounters with depression, whether this is from personal experience or through supporting a family member, a friend, a neighbor or a colleague. We will then look at the relationship between depression, how we feel and activity, what we do or avoid doing in response to how we feel. Finally, we will describe how behavioral activation works and how it can be applied with the help of fictional case examples that reflect typical experiences of depression. Join us and discover how behavioral activation can transform our efforts to combat depression. So I hope this came through okay and you were able to hear that. Great. So let me go let me go back to the slide though. Um, Okay. So that was the look. <laughs> I suspect that you can see that okay now. Back into the slideshow. Uh, not so yet, can... Elena. Not yet. Did you did you press the share button? And you yeah, have. I did. Uh, yeah. But it's not yet. So I think there no. Is... Okay. Maybe take some time. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we Seems are Seems to be loading now. Excellent. No? Not yet. Okay, we'll give it a minute. I think there is a bit of a delay, I think, in the switch. Mm -hmm. Is now done? No. Oh, I'll let you know when it comes up. I thought I'll, uh, I'll try again to stop sharing mm -hmm. and, and start and share again. But I don't understand why it does not um, share just the normal PowerPoint. Right. Okay. Start again. And no, not yet. Mm. It does show that I'm sharing. Now, now it's on. 
Ah, excellent. Okay, excellent. So that was the MOOC. That was the beginning of this of this course. Um, and so far, there are about 4,000 people that signed up from um, over 100 countries. So it is uh, behavioral activation, you will see, because of the nature of it, is very easy to translate across different cultures because it's a value-based um, intervention and you can adapt it. So that was... <coughs> just an overview of the things really we're going to be talking about. And let me start by the experience of depression, because depression means different things to different people. But when we talk about a diagnosis of depression, uh, we are really looking at these first two symptoms at the beginning. So the first one is feeling low, sad or irritable for much of the time. Uh, typically in adolescents, there is irritability, whereas for older adults, more sadness. Um, and then the loss of interest and pleasure in day-to-day -day activities, including interactions with other people. And really, once the, there is persistent symptoms, these two symptoms, then we'll look for further signs that a person may experience clinical depression. Um, and for the sake of, because I work with young people, for the sake of, sort of simplicity, we group these symptoms into two separate categories. What are symptoms really that affect how our mind works and the other four symptoms that affect how our body works. So typical symptoms of uh, depression would be things like difficulty concentrating and paying attention, feeling guilty or disliking ourselves, hopelessness, thoughts of death and self-harm when it comes to really cognitive processes. But then there are also symptoms that are quite bodily sensations. And of course, they can happen with other conditions. That's why we need to look for those once we suspect that the person has depression. Um, interrupted sleep, loss of appetite, or eating too much, too comfort eating, feeling sluggish or agitated, um, or having no energy and feeling tired all the time. So this is the, the, the picture really that we're trying to build when we, we meet someone and they tell us that they struggle with their mood. Um, okay, so I do have another video that sort of describes the experiences of Sarah. It's a fictional case example with quite typical symptoms. So you will listen to Sarah describing her experience of depression and then we use Sarah as a case example to formulate um, depression within a behavioral activation model. So pray this will work. I will stop sharing now and, and try to load the video. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Hello, my name is Sarah. Five years ago, when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, my doctor gave me some healthy eating advice. I found it hard to stick to this, though, as I don't really enjoy cooking, and I've never been a person for regular meals. I tend to eat in... Sorry, it's buffering. I think the internet is stopped. Real struggle, and I just don't seem to be able to find the energy for anything much. I'm finding it difficult even to keep on top of the housework. My eyesight is getting worse, and some of my toes and fingers feel numb a lot of the time. I can't see the dust like I used to, and I feel clumsy and unsteady on my feet. The doctor has given me some tablets to help, but tells me I might have to start injecting insulin if things don't improve. My daughter Rachel keeps ringing me wanting to visit, and I have to keep coming up with excuses to put her off. Don't get me wrong, I do want to see her. I used to really look forward to her and my grandson Lewis coming round. It's just, I feel ashamed of the state the house is getting into. She knows I've always taken such pride in keeping a neat and tidy home. I hate to imagine the look on her face from seeing this mess. I don't want her to think I can't cope anymore. I just don't know what to do or where to start with tidying up. And I'm not sure I could keep up the pretense of everything being okay. Rachel would probably see through it anyway. I think she suspects 
something quite right already. And so I just sit in this chair, feeling miserable and whiling away the hours. It's not like me. I used to be such a happy and positive person. Now everything seems hopeless. So, I hope that gave you a sense, really, of how someone with depression may experience the different signs and symptoms of it. I'll start sharing again. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, now, the next slide. Susie, I, I assume it's all right? You yes, it is. It is. Yes. So... Really, behavioural activation starts by understanding the relationship between mood and activity. And sometimes how I describe it is really something between chicken and egg, because when you feel really good, you want to do things, and the better you feel, the more you do, and the more you do, the better you feel. And the other, the opposite is also true, that if you feel that, what's the point of doing it, which is exactly how people who experience depression feel, then you tend to do less and less. And the, the, the less you do, the worse we feel, and it's a vicious, vicious circle. So behavioral activation tries to break this pattern. And really, the what it tries to, to say is, that you don't have to wait to feel good about yourself or to feel happy and ready in order to do something. You do it in order to make yourself feel better, in order to feel happy. So it is instead of letting our low mood guide our activity, we let our activity be driven by a purpose. And this purpose leads to emotional rewards. Um, and then you see, sort of following through with a chicken and egg analogy, it is not only the amount of activities that we do, but it is also the quality of activities. The activities have to be emotionally rewarding. And what I mean by that? <clears throat> there are three types of rewards uh, that we use in, in therapeutic practice. One is pleasure, enjoying something that we do. One is having a sense of achievement, and by that, I don't mean really doing something major, but doing something that takes a lot of effort, given our emotional state. If you are depressed, getting out of bed or loading the dishwasher is, is a great effort. So doing it is a sense of achievement because it's proportionate to the effort you have put. And finally, a reward is feeling connected with people and things that matter to you. And that is also quite important because the activities have to be meaningful to each person. So pleasure, achievement, connection, I'll come back to it when, you talk about, when I talk about how we do behavioral activation. Um, so that brings us on to what we use within session to formulate depression in the context of BA uh, as a depression cycle, and then how we can break the depression cycle. So the cycle is, a combination of feelings, actions, and rewards. And on the right-hand side, you can see sort of the typical operant conditioning mechanism. And of course, some of you, I assume they're psychologists, or all of you. And um, so really what maintains depression is the lack of positive reinforcement. If we feel low and we do less, we get up, less out of life, less rewards um, in terms of pleasure, sense of achievement and connectedness with people and things that matter. So, of course, if we see something as pointless, we're less likely to do it. Now, what behavioral activation tries to do is to reconnect people with sources of positive reinforcement in their lives. And this is also quite important because we take depression away from the person and we say that it's not you, depression is not within you, but it's really your interaction with the world around you. So once we start introducing forces of positive reinforcement, and this, this has to be stable, then we can see the depression lift. So you remember, Sarah, the case that um, the video was about, her feeling when she spoke about it, where once of, of feeling um, overwhelmed and tired, hopeless and ashamed. 
So some of the things that she didn't do, behavioral deficits and avoidance and procrastination, didn't cook regular meals, although she was diabetic and she would have to eat regularly. She neglected the house and her appearance, and that was important for her because she was house proud. And then she was putting her daughter off from visiting her because she felt ashamed. So what happened really in terms of lack of rewards is that she missed all the opportunities to spend time with her daughter and grandson, um, which would have given her a sense of pleasure and connectedness with them. She could also see her diabetes and her physical health deteriorating. Uh, of course, the less she ate, the less appetite she had, which is a symptom of depression, and the house was a mess and that upset her. And of course, that fed into the feelings of feeling overwhelmed and tired and hopeless and ashamed, and the vicious cycle continued. So how BA works is really, as I mentioned, mo not mood-driven activity, but purpose-driven activity. So we're trying to do more things, but with a purpose. And the purpose is to maximize enjoyable, purposeful and rewarding activities that connect us with people and things we value. And at the same time, we minimize things that are inherent in depression, avoidance, procrastination, sitting there brewing and, and ruminating and withdrawal. So a simple example using Sarah, our case, um, as a case in point is for her to make, so two things, for her to make a small meal and also to phone her daughter to mention that she made the meal and ask about the grandson. So Sarah, in, in sort of later videos within the MOOC, she talks about how she realized that she stopped ruminating when she was cooking the meal and that she felt, you know, she actually felt connected with the daughter and she made herself so proud for looking after, you know, her physical health and diabetes. And she felt proud of herself too. So you can see how the key symptoms of depression, which is self-loathing uh, and isolation and feeling tired and, and losing interest in life, all these things lifted and they fed into even more actions. Now, I have a little animatic to, to, um, to share with you here, so I shall, which tidies up all the things that we have been saying. So um, I shall try to to do this, okay. How can you break the cycle of negative emotions? The worse we feel, the less we do. we do, the better we feel. When you're having a bad day, it's hard to do the things that make you feel better. You can get into a cycle of doing less and feeling worse. Behavioral activation is about supporting you to do things, even when you don't feel like doing them. The trick is to do something because you planned it. We call this purpose-driven activity. It's not effective to wait until you feel like doing it. We call that mood-driven activity. Choose purpose-driven activity, not mood-driven activity. How does behavioral activation work? When you complete a purpose-driven activity, you hatch positive emotions. These are pleasure, a sense of achievement, connection with who and what matters to you. Positive emotions make you feel like doing more activities. When you complete these, you hatch even more positive emotions. This is a positive cycle. Purpose-driven activities kickstart a cycle of positive emotions.
I, I hope that was okay. You were able to hear the music and the, the voiceover, Susie? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. So what? Yeah. It was so... We could see it perfectly. Excellent. And you would see, and you saw a little uh, logo there, COMBAT, which is one of the studies that I lead, which is depression in adolescence. And COMBAT stands for community-based behavioral activation training. And I will say a little bit more about it. But this is part of the animations that we use with young people to explain mm -hmm. behavioral activation and depression. So I'll over back to my... Uh, um, okay. I'm getting the hang of this. So let's go back to where we were. Uh, can you press the full? Oh, yeah, okay. Is that, is that can you yes, see well? Yes, yes, it is. So, so really, how do we do things in practice? And this is, I mentioned combat, which is a large, 2.5 million project over five years in which we are training school-based staff and staff within charities, youth organizations, and health services to deliver behavioral activation for young people, 12 to 18 year olds. And, and, and some of the things that I'm going to be talking about is um, that showing you uh, what we do in practice with young people. So behavioral activation uh, has three key components. And these are activity scheduling, activity monitoring, and activity review. So the activity scheduling starts with a weekly calendar. And it's just a blank calendar with the days of the week and then split into morning, afternoon, and evening. So the young person starts with a calendar. And in that calendar, they have, we have, and we schedule together um, three types of activities, things that they want to do, things that they have to do, necessary tasks and routines, and activities that contribute towards bigger and future goals. So, but these are not just random things. They are things that we, they connect with areas in their life that are important to them. So we use something we call the life pie, um, and it is whether you call it a pizza or a pie, but, uh, but it's, it has three key segments. There are things that have to do with people and relationships, family, friends, other relationships, things that have to do with young people's worlds, like school, work, hobbies and interests, their home, or if home is a fraught place, then we ask them what their favorite place is. And then things that have to do with themselves, with self-care, with health, and with their personal qualities and strengths. And it takes almost a full session, a full sort of 40 minute session to go through each segment of the pie and understand what is important to young people within these segments and why. It might be, for example, we ask, who do you consider as part of your close family? And they may say, I don't know, my mom, my brother, and my pet dog. Um, and then is understanding what is special in their relationships with each of these people, because the activities have to link with each of these people and also with the thing that they most value in their relationships with their mom, with their brother, with their dog. And so forth with school. A lot of young people, they say, oh, God, I hate school. I mean, I can't think of anything enjoyable or, or rewarding that you're asking me to do. But if you looked it down, it may be actually they like the, 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 the school lunch or they love spending time with their friends at lunchtime or they may, they may be particularly fond of a particular teacher. So we're trying to find out things that connect with people and and places and aspects of their life that matter to each young person. And this is how we start building their pleasures, routines, and goals around this life pie. So the activity scheduling involves usually two or three things that they have to do every week that we anticipate to be rewarding. And then they go away during the week and they fill in the calendar by writing down what they did, with whom, where, and when, um, and they have to do it not only for the things that they we scheduled, but also for things that they even did spontaneously. And for each of these activities, they have to write down how much they enjoyed it, 
how much it gave them a sense of accomplishment and achievement, and how much it made them feel connected and it related to people and things that mattered from the lifetime. And they score that between zero and 10. So this is how a calendar that would have this information would look like for a young person. There may be gaps within the calendar, but it doesn't matter. We say that as long as you put something on some days, morning, afternoon, and evening, to get a sense of all the things that, you, that may be rewarding or not rewarding, then we, we are okay. So as you can see, some of the activities, they are at home, at school, and the young person has given pack scores, so pleasure seven, uh, achievement to end connection seven. This is physical education. I suspect they enjoyed. They don't feel it particularly sort of contributed towards the progress at school, but it connected them with their friends. So this is how a calendar will come back to the practitioner who will support the behavioral activation sessions. And then the next stage is really to look at the calendar and then group the activities to high and low pack because we know that high pack activities, we need to reinforce them. And the low pack activities, we need to see whether we can change them so then they have more value in the next week's activity calendar. So physically, the practitioner, the professional who supports the young person would highlight one color, all the activities that have at least one high pack score. And by that, I mean something that scored five and above from that scale of zero to 10. So the English, it was very much connection, maybe because the young person liked the teacher. So during the session, we talk about what makes each activity low or high in terms of the pleasure, the achievement and the connection it gave to the young person. There might be activities that we can see here, watch TV and played on the phone, are quite low in pack scores or dinner alone. But then you have dinner with mum, which typically has more pleasure and more connection. So within this calendar, we start making connections about what really contributes to rewarding activities and what not. And once we review all this, then we create an activities bank. So although behavioral activation uh, takes place during weekly sessions, we try that by the end of it, the young person would have um, a big sort of table of a bank of pleasures, necessary tasks and routines and goals that relate to each of these segments of life within the life pie. Um, so then when really support from a professional ends, they're able to go away and use their activities bank to schedule activities um, week after week to maintain their progress. So. I hope that gives you a sense of, of some of the things that, um, that happen within um, behavioral activation sessions. And it's quite, you can see that it is quite straightforward, although there are, of course, barriers. Um, and before I go to that, of course, there are behavioral barriers and obstacles is simple in principle, but of course, much harder in practice. Um, and we describe the behavioral obstacles as black holes to give an image of things that young people get stuck with, or you know, anyone, really, even adults, um, things that they don't do or they avoid doing. They cannot start it because, of course, motivation is greatly impaired by depression. So it's how do we get out of the black hole to be able to complete the activities that we scheduled? And there are various ways of doing that, graded activity is, is the key. So we're trying to break down each activity into small increments that may take place over several weeks. But the most important thing is the completion rather than how big the task was. The other thing is having support by someone. So shaping the behavior with the help of someone else. So the various strategies that a practitioner or the therapist will use to be able to counteract the black holes that get in the way of activity scheduling. Um, and then something else we call grey clouds, which is things that people tend to do when they experience depression, which are actually unhelpful and make them feel worse. A typical example would be, um, you know, a teenager listening to really broody uh, music when they feel really low, or reading depressing news or depressing novels. And of course, we're not trying to shield people from bad news or from depressive novels because, or, or sort of solemn music because that, that's the world. However, 
for the sake of behavioral activation, we have a period where we try to avoid things that really mirror depression. Um, irritability is a key symptom for depression in adolescence. So things like, I don't know, heavy metal music that really boosts aggression. That's also something that I've come across. Um, so what you're trying is to go to do the opposite, really, of what the depression tells you to do. And that is a key principle in behavioral activation. So do the opposite to what depression leads you to do. Uh, and finally, red zones. I mean, some impulsive or addictive actions that put young people at risk, whether it's psychological risk or social or actually physical risk, we also have to be mindful because they may come back with a diary, which has, you know, a lot of activities that have 10 as pleasure, but it might be because they ended up gaming in their room for 10 hours. So internet addiction or other things that might be harmful, like, like you know, calming themselves, cutting themselves, um, and that gives them relief. And sometimes they score this high on the pleasure. So we need to be mindful of the quality of the activities and that these do not do more harm than good. So I shall wrap this up with an animatic which talks about the activity calendar and the different stages again. This is written for young people, but I think it conveys this, the essence of what happens in behavioral activation and what's the, the key component. So let me stop sharing and then go to animatic two. There we are. Um, I don't think you can see now, no? Okay. Close your eyes. And then... Yes, yes, we can see it. The activity calendar in behavioral activation. Let's make an activity calendar in five steps. Step one, pick a format that's easy for you to use regularly. It can be paper or electronic, like on your phone. You can use the blank calendar we've given you, but you don't have to. Step two. Make a note of one activity in the morning, one activity in the afternoon, and one activity in the evening. Describe each activity using the four W's. What you did, where you did it, when you did it, with whom, or alone. Include activities that you scheduled in advance, but also things you didn't or times you do nothing. That's right, because we're always doing something when we're doing nothing. Like sleeping, or looking out of the window, or lying in bed thinking. The calendar works best when it's an accurate picture of your week. Be honest with what you do or don't do. Nobody will judge you. So record as much as you can. Don't worry if there are blanks. Step three, rate every activity for the pleasure it gave you. How much did you enjoy it on a scale of zero to 10? Step four, rate every activity for the sense of achievement it gave you. Achievement comes from completing something that takes effort <coughs> and feel low, however small or easy it might seem to others. The greater the effort, the greater the achievement. How rewarding was it to complete the activity on a scale of zero to ten? Step five. 
Rate how connected each activity made you feel to people and things that matter to you. For example, your people, family, friends, and other relationships. Your world, hobbies and interests, your home or favorite place, your school or work, yourself, your health, your self-care, your personal qualities. How connected did the activity make you feel on a scale of zero to 10? Now you've got a record of what you did and how emotionally rewarding it was. You'll notice that not every activity gives you all three emotional rewards. Some give you only pleasure, some mostly achievement. They each connect in different areas of life. Now you've got information to help you shed your things so you can get pleasure and achievement from different activities across the week and to connect with many different areas of your life. A weekly calendar shows what we planned to do, what we did and how rewarding it was. I hope that gave a sense of um, sort of wrapped up how behavioral activation is really done. And within the combat team, which I mentioned was the, um, um, the, the, the project where we treat depression in adolescence with mild to moderate depression, sometimes we use the PAC scores. I use it as a joke. So I walk into the office and all the colleagues who work in combat, research assistants and research fellows, they're having a great time, you know, they giggle. And so I walk in and I say, well, I can see pleasure 10, connection 10, but achievement zero. So get back to work. So it has been, so you can see this, you know, this, this sense of the, the path, pleasure achievement connection is so much embedded within BA. And I think by the end of it, young people do it automatically without having to write it down. Right, back to sharing. Um, and I think I will wrap up. Um, okay. Now, can we see this, Susie? Uh, okay. Uh, yes. You can see it, yeah, excellent. We can see it, but not in its full view. Right, let me go there. Okay, so, um, so really to sum up the, the roadmap of BA, we start with a weekly calendar, we review the PAC scores and we group them into low and high. The life pie gives us a sense of what is meaningful for each person. Then we create the activities bank, which we use to schedule activities week by week. And alongside, we, we have strategies to tackle avoidance, procrastination and harmful activities. Um, and a quick glance at the evidence base for BA, because I told you how it is done, but do we know whether it works and whether it's good value for money? There is quite, I mean, when we look at the evidence base, of course, at the top of the, the pyramid of the evidence, you have systematic reviews and randomized control trials. Now, there are loads of randomized control trials or RCTs for um, adult depression and older adult depression. And a lot of the, the largest trials in the field actually were completed by colleagues within the University of York. However, for young people, there is only one RCT which was done in the, in, in the States. Um, that's why the combat program is so important because it will give us definitive evidence um, as to whether BA works with young people. Um, and there are also a handful of systematic reviews. Most of them are for adults and a couple of them for children and young people. So based on and, and the MOOC that I mentioned um, at the beginning, and also I think I, I included the link in the advert that went out for the lecture, so you, you, can, um, you can see it in detail. Um, I give examples and I give the references there for the reviews and the RCTs that you can look at. But what, what's the headline in terms of clinical and cost effectiveness. 
does BA work? We have robust evidence that BA for depression is effective for adults, both working age adults and older adults. Um, but we don't have enough evidence for adolescents. The evidence from the, that small RCT that happened in the States and from sort of small open studies and case studies um, show that results are promising for adolescents. Also, surprisingly, despite the lack of evidence, because it is such an, an old and established treatment, actually every single well-being practitioner and therapist who works with children and young people in the UK is trained in BA anyway. So what we're trying to do is to find out whether um, those who are not trained in BA, if they have the training, they could also deliver it. Because there was something that we found in studies with adults um, in terms of BA, and that was that it can be delivered by junior mental health workers without any previous psychology training or therapy training, only by being trained in BA. And this, of course, made it good value for money. So BA proved to be less costly, but as effective as more complex treatments like cognitive therapy for depression delivered by specialist psychologists. Um, and this means two things. It means that whether you're a specialist or actually a person who is, is doing a bit of voluntary work within an, a community organization, you could incorporate BA within your practice. Um, I mentioned that BA is taught in, for practitioners who work with children and young people. And also in the NHS here in, in England, uh, BA is the first line treatment for mild to moderate depression. So for adults, um, so clinical guidelines recommended and is the first thing really that the people get if they are referred to a service for depression. After that, if the depression is more severe, they may end up having more complex treatments. But I think they, the priming, the start is always BA in England. Um, and I'll finish off by mentioning some, some studies, some research currently at the University of York. There is a body of work that some of my colleagues do um, with adults. There's a study called Chemist, uh, and that was for mild depression for people with long-term illness. And their behavioral activation in this case was delivered by pharmacists. So when people were going to pick up the prescription for diabetes um, or for other long-term illness, then the pharmacist was trained on how to do behavioral activation. Um, and there's also two studies for older adults over 65 years old. One was called Basel, and that's to tackle isolation. It was a study that happened during COVID. So older adults with mobility problems and with mild depression, they had BA through the phone. Uh, and MODS is a study where it looks again at older adults who have multiple physical problems like pain. Um, and my, my own pride and joy, COMBAT, which treats mild moderate depression, schools and as I said, charities and NGOs. A colleague of mine at the University of York is just starting a trial which is similar to COMBAT, but is more for severe depression and have this within specialist services, but also with adolescents. So <clears throat> this is COMBAT, Community Delivered Behavioural Activation Training. Um, and we're going to recruit around 250 young people. Half of them will receive BA and half of them usual care and will follow them up for 12 months. Now, as part of COMBAT, we will introduce a digital component. So instead of having pieces of paper to do like the calendar and highlighting the low and high pack activities, everything will happen automatically with an algorithm. So young people can have a choice either to use their phone to be able to do all the activities uh, and like scheduling, monitoring and review, or use a paper calendar because some young people during the feasibility study told us, well, you know, I use my phone quite a lot. So it's really nice to be able to have a piece of paper and scribble in it, but at least, you know, there will be choice. So I am mindful of the time and I shall leave it here. And thank you for listening. And thank you very much, Susie, for having me here mm. and for um, you know organizing everything. Thank you. I'll stop sharing so then we can have a chat if you want. Mm -hmm. uh... Lina, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting and uh, uh, nice presentation. Uh, if you don't mind me, I would like to ask a question. Uh, so, because you are doing clinical work, but at the same time you you are doing research, I was wondering, 
whether you do have some uh, evidence, some data on any factors that may affect the success rates? Mm -hmm. Very good question. And this is something we, we have to look at because um, one of the, so there are, yes, the straightforward answer is two, two factors. One is uh, family background and socioeconomic background because mm -hmm. usually when you offer psychological therapies, they are taken up by families that are better educated or more affluent. Mm -hmm. And these families have money to be able to facilitate activities, they have perhaps more time, as opposed to families who either have lower income or where parents in the families have mental health problems themselves. So family circumstances is one thing that, again, I don't have research data on this, but from day-to-day -day practice, I notice that we mm -hmm. have to adapt the treatment for families who are not privileged. And the second thing is ethnicity. And this is surprising because I found that certain ethnic groups, that they, they place a lot of value in hard work mm -hmm. um, and being you know, going to church or going to mosque and then studying for school and not having anything else outside. These children tend to benefit a lot from it because mm -hmm. you give the parents permission to allow the child to do something other than working hard, doing religious studies, obeying the parents. So it's liberating. And I was amazed by the quick success we had with some ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So these are two interesting things I observed, but as part of combat, as we're collecting data, we are gonna do a bit of an analysis to see whether it works better for some families and young people rather than not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to say a few things about the clinical psychology course and then after we are finished with this, maybe we can uh, uh, arrange a, a discussion, a chat or another meeting to see whether we can find any links between the course and the projects that uh, you present, uh, either at clinical level or research-wise. Uh, so. Uh, I do have a few slides to make it easier. Of course, I was expecting this to be in a way interactive, but uh, <laughs> um, it seems that arrangements were a little bit different than what we expected. So I will present uh, the basic info about the course so that you also get an idea. Yeah, that'd be wonderful because there is always, obviously, we have master students and PhD by publications mm -hmm. and masters by thesis because the projects are so big, then anyone who is interested in, in doing something as part of it, then mm -hmm. the, the door is open. Mm -hmm. I think you can see the, the PowerPoint. Great. So uh, this is an MSc. I know that uh, in the UK you do have doctor doctorates in clinical psychology and the MSCs in clinical psychology are not to give license for a clinical psychology, uh, for a clinical psychologist, but they are just for assistant clinical psychologists. Uh, so this is an MSc in clinical uh, psychology uh, offered here by the Department of Psychology at City College. And uh, uh, do you see the slides moving, Lina? Yes. Yeah. Great. I, I see. Great. Uh, so it does. La there are two options uh, uh, doing this course. The first one is to do it with a dissertation, in which case it lasts for one year. And uh, the second option is to do it with a clinical placement, in which case it lasts for one, and a uh, one year and a five months, or two years part-time. Uh, the final award is an MSc in clinical psychology. People can do it either full-time or part-time. The mode of delivery is face-to-face. Uh, -face. And uh, the location, of course, is in Thessaloniki. Uh, if we have any people uh, who uh, come from other backgrounds, uh, non-psychologists, I mean, uh, someone, a graduate with a clinical psychology master's can work as a mental health counselor, consultant, policymaker, clinical practitioner, trainer, 
and subject to uh, undergraduate background that is a bachelor's in psychology they can also work as practitioner psychologists after doing such a course uh, the the course is divided into three semesters the first two semesters are the taught uh, ones so in the taught semesters people undertake four modules in each semester in the first semester they undertake current paradigms in counseling and psychotherapy fundamentals of neuropsychology introduction to research and psychopathology and in the second semester they undertake core skills in clinical practice clinical interviewing and assessment severe mental health issues interventions for anxiety and depression uh, I think it's important to stress that the content, the delivery mode, and anything else that has to do with the design of the course is in line with what the Healthcare Professions Council sets with regards to the professional uh, standards and the fitness to practice criteria. So uh, the modules that are there and uh, the practical components, the, the approach, uh, that the, the program is based on, they all have to do with the uh, core competencies that a clinical psychologist uh, should possess. So as I said, uh, people have the option of either doing the dissertation after finishing with the taught part, which is four units in the first semester and the other four in the second, or they can do the practical internship. The dissertation is an empirical study, either quantitative or qualitative, uh, and the practical internship is uh, 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 based on a 50 hours of, of a foundation course uh, done at the first of the second at the beginning of the second year, a hundred hours of practical work within a, within a chosen clinical setting, and 40 hours of supervision that is offered uh, by the department. Uh, the course has been. Um, uh, assessed uh, by uh, Dr. Marie Collier from uh, the University of Chester and who emphasized uh, uh, the clinical skills and the focus on major mental health difficulties and reco uh, recovery issues and uh, characterized this course as uh, a strong one in the sense that it gives real life examples to the students uh, so they develop the skills that a clinical psychologist would develop in any other case. So I will stop sharing now this basic info about the course. So placing uh, your uh, presentation as associated with a particular course uh, because anxiety and depression are a, a two very essential components of clinical psychology and we actually have them as a separate module. I think there are many, we can find many links uh, between research at York and uh, uh, the program, the program we will we'll be running next year. And uh, I forgot to mention also that we do have a counseling center, which is open to the local community. So we do have clients using our counseling services and trainees also practicing in our counseling center. So there could be some nice research or pro projects, uh, both at practical uh, and uh, the counseling uh, context to, to take place. Wonderful. The, the, the course is so focused. I didn't know much about it. So it's focused, it's clinical. It looks, mm -hmm. uh, it looks amazing. I can't believe you do that in a year. That's incredible. Uh, yes, uh, the practicum actually starts, the, pra the, the clinical internship starts after students finish with the theoretical part. And uh, because it is uh, uh, within chosen clinical settings, it's going to be very intensive. So normally, people wouldn't be finished within uh, half a year with their practice. But uh, because it's going to be very structured and associated with particular clinical settings, uh, we hope that uh, the duration will be fixed within one, in, one year and five, uh, six months, sorry. I see. Wow. So it's uh, congratulations and such an 
a, a wonderful course and thank you for yes bringing it to my attention and for um, inviting me and I, I look forward really to making more links at any level research and teaching mm -hmm. supervision that is open and of course there are at the university of york here in in in, in york there's other things that are quite novel in terms of interventions like one session treatment for specific phobias for severe and complex specific phobias or CBT for psychosis. So there's a lot of, there's a, a greater really network of people, interventions mm -hmm. and opportunities. So um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lina. Uh, looking forward to our next uh, meeting. Indeed. So I'll say bye bye to everyone that we cannot see, but yes. I hope everyone enjoyed it and thank you for having me. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.